Hey everyone, this is Michael Cole. I'm VP of Marketing at Everflow, and today I'm joined by Matt. Matt, do you mind giving a quick introduction for yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So, pleasure to meet you all. My name is Matthew Santos. Uh, I'm currently the Vice President of Products and Strategy here at Neil Patel Excel. Uh, been in the industry for uh, just about eight years now, and uh, have always been on the agency side of things. So. I've worked for some really large agency firms in the past and really have seen um, at multiple levels how to go about doing SEO, paid media, and just overall digital marketing tactics to improve lead generation. Um, and uh, yeah, super excited to be here with you guys today. I'm super excited to have you. I mean, SEO is one of those things that's so valuable and so important, but also it's got like the most like quackery where it's really hard to understand like what actually matters and like, what is the truth? Like, when am I just wasting my time? And when is it something that I actually should focus on? So hopefully we can uh, explore some of those ideas. And by the end of this uh, chat, I will become an SEO master and be really good at my job. That's, the That's goal. what I'm looking forward to. Cool. So uh, how did you become involved with Mil Patel and the agency in the first place? Yeah, great question. So my my first job in this space uh, out of college was for an agency by the name of Boostability. They're they're a really large SEO firm based here in Utah. And um, my my VP of marketing, he and I we created a great relationship. And he was actually asked to come in and help start up an agency for <laughs> Neil uh, here in Utah about two years ago. Um, and Neil already had several other agencies. We have one in Brazil. We have our headquarters down in San Diego. Uh, we have offices. We have about seven different offices. But Neil wanted to create something specific for the small and medium business size of the market. He'd always been appealing heavily to like the enterprise side and the Fortune 100. And he wanted to spread his wings and really open it up to almost all sizes of businesses. And so um, through that connection from Boostability, uh, they realized I had the right amount of knowledge to help create their product offering here. And so they brought me over uh, back in uh, February of 2019. And one side note for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the reason we're just saying like Neil Patel is like amazing SEO is like, if you look up basically any digital marketing keyword on Google, he's almost always within like the top three results. Like he's just completely dominated the SEO space. And he's just really good with being like the go-to source for all things digital marketing in terms of like learning. Um, so it's like, there's few people that know more what they're doing than um, Neil Patel and his agency. Yep, uh, so just as like a helpful takeaway for anyone listening to begin with, like, what is the most common mistake you see in SEO that you recommend fixing first? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the, the way that I perceive SEO and, and a lot of other experts out there, including Neil, is we do look at it in layers. And I think the foundation, like the first layer that everyone needs to focus on is technical. Um, what are the technical aspects of your website that can halt the user experience in some way, shape or form? And I think one of the biggest things that people ignore right off the bat is site speed. Um, that's one of the biggest things that impact somebody experiencing your website to its fullest. If your pages are loading slow or if elements on your pages are taking a long time to load, people don't really have the patience anymore to sit around and wait for that. They're gonna go right back to Google and click on the next listing. So I think site speed optimization is really that first thing that people need to emphasize and make sure your website is loading as quickly as possible across the board. So on site speed, I, every time I go to like any news website and I don't <laughs> go through an RSS or something else, like I always realize like it's, it's unbelievable that like sites like HuffPo and stuff can take like 30 seconds to load ads and stuff. If like the biggest content sites are loading that slowly, like what are your thoughts there? Like, why is this like, especially for anything that's like news or publications, I feel like this is like an endemic problem. Like what are they doing wrong? 
Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is they may not be leveraging something that we call a content delivery network, a CDN for short. Um, and, and what a CDN does for you is rather than having one server hosting all of your files and all of your web pages, and no matter where you are on the planet, you're still referencing that one server in like Omaha, Nebraska, that's going to cause a really long load time for your website. Mm. Now, a CDN takes that concept and spreads it out to multiple servers around the globe or around a specific country so that when people are coming from different spots of the world viewing your site, it's going to be significantly quicker. And I think a lot of the times websites like Huffington Post or, or Washington Post, any of the ones you just mentioned, they are they were built some of them decades ago and um, they're still operating off of old servers from back then. And so I think upgrading to those new standards of, of content delivery networks could, could do a massive world of good for them. Awesome. And for marketers preparing for 2021 plans, um, what are the core elements that you think they should include in their SEO strategy? If you were going to just be like, here is like the checklist of things to make sure you're doing, what would they be? Yeah, great question. I think first thing, like I mentioned before, you got to put technical at the forefront. I always give the analogy, you can have PhD level content on your website. You can have the most engaging content and videos and images, but if those pages aren't loading quick enough, no one's ever going to see it. Also on a technical standpoint, I would add to that list indexability. Just ensure that Google and all the other search engines are indexing your pages properly. Google is like a library. And if your book is not in the library, no one can check that book out, right? So ensure that Google's actually indexing these pages so they have the potential to rank. So site speed, indexing from a technical standpoint, um, and also uh, broken pages or, or, or redirect loops. I think that's also something I would always emphasize from a technical standpoint. Um, when it comes to your actual website, something I would also add to that list for 2021 would be content. Content will always be at the forefront of Google's algorithm because content is how we digest information. And I always try telling people, content is an umbrella term. It doesn't have to always mean words. It can mean videos, images, infographics, white papers, eBooks, data sheets, comparison sheets, whatever have you, just make sure you are providing the right type of content for your audience in the right size format. So in different industries, if people consume information quickly, offer podcasts and quick blog posts. If they like more information, then give them those long pieces of blogs or long eBooks so that they're getting exactly what they're looking for. Um, and one last thing that I'll always add as part of uh, a list in going into the next year is organic link building tactics. I think links are literally like votes online. They're, they're votes of confidence, votes of authoritativeness. And so you want to make sure that you're building content that is authoritative enough to get third party websites to host that content and link back to you. So th those would be a couple items that, that I would put at the forefront of 2021. Awesome. So one of those you mentioned, um, like white papers and stuff, mm -hmm. um, is Google smart enough to rank up on things like PDFs or does it like have to be text in that situation? Yeah, that's that's actually a really good question. And and Google's gotten significantly better at that over the years where if 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 Google feels like the answer is better in a PDF format, you will start to see PDFs within uh, the search engine result pages. They'll actually tag right on the title tag in like parentheses, they'll put PDF or they'll say dot PDF. So you know where you're going. Um, but yeah, PDFs are able to rank nowadays. Um, so it doesn't always just have to be web copy on a page. It can be PDF format. Um, sometimes I've even seen like Google Sheets rank. Um, so if you have really good information in like a Google Sheet and you allow that to somehow be indexed, those those are elements that can rank on Google. Awesome. And for the like the technical side, um, is there uh, for like say like an e-commerce brand, like is there any like website builders or e-commerce stores that uh, like tools that you would recommend for like a good starting place? They're like launching a product and they just want to make sure that it's going to be good enough for SEO. Absolutely. I think Shopify is at the top of that list. Uh, and, and I say that for multiple reasons. Like Shopify has completely revolutionized, in my opinion, the e-commerce space because it provides that quick entrance into building an online store, an online brand. They allow you to do 
drag and drop builders for your website or offer full themes where you can just plug in data today and have a website launched by this evening. They also, uh, towards the beginning of this conversation, I mentioned content delivery networks, CDNs. Spotify by default has CDNs built into some of your Shopify. Some of platforms. Uh, yeah, Shopify does. Yeah. And, um, and, and these are things that um, can help increase the speed of your website and, and allow users to have that great experience with your e-commerce platform. Um, and, and also on top of that, Shopify has tons of apps built into it. So almost anything you want to add as a feature, I'm pretty sure Shopify has it as um, an app. And so you don't have to code it. You don't have to hire a developer to build it for you and spend thousands of dollars on that. You, you can simply leverage an app and, and have that feature on your website in minutes. So I, I would definitely go with, with, with a platform like that. Yeah, and what's great about Shopify is you can instantly integrate with Everflow. <laughs> there you go. Cool. So there, are, uh, is there any parts of like traditional SEO advice that you would recommend ignoring as they take too much time and they don't make a notable difference? Yeah, that's 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 actually uh, something that we try and emphasize in SEO is every year. What are the things that are kind of being sunsetted by the algorithm that Google's not really paying much attention to? Um, I think one thing that comes to mind is meta keywords. That, that's something that over the last couple of years, you still see CMSs like uh, Shopify, WordPress, uh, Magento. They include sections in the back end of each page that says meta keywords. And for some people who don't know any better, they try and fill all that stuff out. And <laughs> sometimes that can be a complete waste of time. Um, so emphasize keywords on the front end of your pages. So on your, in your headers, in your content, in your blog posts, um, that's where you should really be emphasizing keywords, not, not so much in really those meta keyword fields. Um, another thing that I try emphasizing for people, just to give you a second thing, would be keyword density. I, I think over the years, we've heard a lot about people analyzing the algorithm and determining, hey, there's this window of percentages of how many times you should put keywords into your content. Um, and, and Google's come out over the last few years and said, look, keyword density is not really a factor we look into. But there's a caveat to that. Like if you are abusing a keyword and stuffing it, like for every hundred words, your keyword is found 30 times. When you read that content out loud, it's going to sound, it's going to sound terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to make sure that your content still sounds good, still sounds intuitive. Um, but I also think keyword density is something that you don't really have to pay attention to or do some sort of math equation to figure out what your density is. Um, just make sure it sounds natural and, and that'll get you ranking. So it sounds like a lot of the SEO stuff is just that like it's becoming more and more just aligned with like good like marketing habits. Like you should have your content focused on your audience and keywords. And that's what matters there for ranking up anyway. Absolutely. I think I think a lot of what you'll hear me say today is based around user experience. Like like Google makes over nine algorithm changes per day. Like some years it's over 3000 changes in the whole year to the algorithm. And all of those changes more often than not are tailored towards a better user experience. So anytime you are abusing the experience of, of your audience and your users, that's gonna have a detriment to your rankings. Awesome. And then are there some uh, underappreciated tactics that you would recommend incorporating in SEO strategies? Yeah, absolutely. I think something that people gloss over a little bit are their header tags. Um, there is a hierarchy for how Google's robots index a specific page. And, and I think some of the first elements we're all aware of, of how Google identifies what a page is about are your meta titles, your meta descriptions. But then after that, it's the header, the header structure. And then after header structure is your actual content. But more often than not, we ignore that header layer and we don't really include keywords in our headers or, or put headers that are really tailored towards what this section is going to be about to give mm -hmm. great context to the users and great context to the search engine. So really making sure that you're leveraging your, your, your main header, your H1, in the best possible way. And also nesting those headers. So having an, a, an H2 underneath the H1 and an H3 underneath the H2. This is how Google indexes information. And, and we can't gloss over that. So when you say headers, it's really like make sure that like your head, your main headline has like the keywords and contents you want to rank for, and then your subheadline, which would, which be H two, yep. having 
sort of follow up additional content and then lower on the page have like H3 and H4 content, which are like smaller and smaller text bolded areas. Yes. They're each matching towards what you want Google to think your website's about. Yep. You hit it right on the head. That's spot on, Michael. And I think a lot of the time um, we as users have that same perception. Like if I'm using an H2 or an H3, my text is getting smaller. So I don't want to use that anymore. And what I tell people is you have HTML and you have CSS. So from an HTML standpoint, code it with the proper header, H2, H3, H4. And then from CMS, from a CSS standpoint, then add the styling to it to make sure that your headers are the sizes you want or the colors mm -hmm. you want or the boldness or italicized or underlined. You can make all that stuff look uniform from a CSS standpoint. Don't ever sacrifice the HTML elements. That's a great point. Cool. So um, I know that Google now ranks around intent matching instead of uh, pure string matching. Like it actually tries to figure out like, what is the intent of this content? Can you explain a little bit about what intent matching is and how it works? Absolutely. So I think the first thing I want to mention with that is, is Google came out earlier this year with a, a really big algorithm change called BERT. Um, and what BERT basically did was it, it, it added a whole new system for how the algorithm can understand content. It's, it's just trying to become more and more like a human brain. That, that's the best way I explain it is, is it's trying to understand the thought behind the words. And so a lot of the times in the past, you would optimize a page by stuffing in specific keywords. And that was really the only way you can rank for that keyword. But nowadays, as long as you have enough of a thought spread out on that page, Google can see the synonyms, the antonyms, the acronyms. They can understand all of that surrounding information, even if you don't include it in the content. And so as long as you're being thorough enough in your message, Google's going to do its own homework in the background with understanding your industry and trying to say, hey, this web page can actually rank for these other keywords as well. And so over time, that's only going to increase in its effectiveness. And, and it's all based on how you present that content. So making sure that that your, your, your content is thorough enough is going to be one of the most important factors. Cool. And then what are the sort of like knowing that, like what should you focus on in terms of like optimizing for intent matching? Good question. Uh, so I think a lot of the times um, websites start off fairly thin and, and you get into like a blogging system where you have a lot of blogs coming out on like a consistent basis. Um, but I think the biggest thing is not blogging just for the sake of blogging. Look at your product, look at your services, try and figure out what are all the different angles that your user is thinking about or searching about when thinking about your product and creating blog posts around that information and creating this interlinking structure between your blog posts and your product and service pages. That's also how Google can see a lot more intent behind what is occurring with your content. Now, one tactic that I, I've used heavily over the years and, and what's achieved so much success from Neil, for Neil Patel is looking at what we call like the Wikipedia format and the Wikipedia formula, um, which is basically Wikipedia creates a pillar page on a given topic. And they don't go out and keep creating a bunch more pages on that topic. They kind of come back and every so often they let user generated content keep refreshing that topic. So year after year, as an industry changes or as something new happens with the celebrity or whatever have you, that information keeps getting added to the same page and makes the content more thorough over time. And so I think that is something that helps increase the overall intent, kind of increases your web of keywords you could potentially rank for, is by going back to old pieces of content and refreshing them, bringing them up to 2020 or 2021 standards, um, giving them the new information that may have come out a couple months ago in your industry, um, and just giving them love again, you know, because it'll get them kind of reinvigorated in, in the in the rankings. So I think that's a great way of, of going about uh, increasing um, your, your, your signals from an intent based. Yeah, you just said that super clearly, but I still want to highlight it one more time because I think that, that is some incredible, like very actionable SEO advice. Like go back to your, the, to the content that best reflects your brand and keep refreshing them year after year because 
it can still get more and more SEO value as it goes. And Google actually appreciates that. I think that's a incredibly good um, insight that a lot of marketers should be doing in 2021. Yep. Great. So speaking more about content, um, is there like specific types of content that create the biggest impact? Like, is it a mix of elements, like just peer writing plus a video? Like what, what are sort of the best um, makeup of uh, great SEO ranking content? Yeah, I think it, it's highly dependent on your industry. Um, I said it before, which was do some analysis of your audience, really put yourself in their shoes and, and determine what is the age range of my typical buyer? What is the gender split? What geographical regions are they coming from? And how do they like to consume information? So if you're noticing that you have a much younger crowd that you're appealing to, maybe podcasts and videos are, are going to be a little bit more appealing to them. If you have more of a middle-aged crowd, maybe blog posts or some sort of infographic that can visualize data for them in a very quick format, maybe the best format. So I think it's highly dependent on the industry, on who you're catering to. And Google, time and time again, is not just going to put a blanket over its rankings and say, blog posts are the only way you can rank. It's always going to look at how users are coming to Google, typing in a keyword, what's popping up from that keyword, what they're clicking on and where they're spending the most time. Google does a lot of data crunching on that side. And as they keep seeing that for this specific keyword, users are loving podcasts, then you should create podcasts. If for another type of keyword, they're seeing users are loving blog posts or eBooks or PDFs, then you should create content in that format. So it's just highly dependent on maybe doing some quick surveys for your audience or just doing a little bit of questioning to your audience to figure out what are the best ways that you like to consume your information because we want to produce that format of content. Yeah, that's awesome advice. I had no idea that it could handle like podcasts and stuff and rank up there. Yep. I mean, yeah, obviously you know, video it can because they spent so much effort in YouTube. Exactly. I mean, YouTube is a Google property and and, and Google does a great job of, of creating a, a search engine within YouTube. Uh, but Neil, Neil is a great example of that. Um, Neil launched his podcast a couple of years ago. And for some of the keywords that Neil ranks for, his podcast is what's right there at number one. And again, it just it's just a testament to Google really realizing that people who are wanting quick marketing information maybe doing it while driving in the car. And so they can't read a blog post in that instance. Maybe a podcast is a better format. Cool. So if someone were going back and like refreshing old content, should they sort of like go in and also if they produce like say videos or podcasts, like be adding that inside of like their existing pillar article? That's a great point, Michael. I think Mixing in and, and that multimedia approach can have a great impact. And I think sometimes you'll see in blog posts that they'll start off with content, then midway through, if there's a topic that was discussed that's hyper relevant to a video, they'll embed that video right there for more information. As you keep going down, they'll realize, oh, an infographic we created a couple months ago is also relevant to this data point. And either they'll interlink to that infographic or they'll actually embed it in there. Same with podcasts, putting in a quick snippet of, of maybe uh, a minute of the podcast of where this topic was discussed, embedding that in there rather than trying to have them go through the whole podcast and find that one section themselves. So I think starting to go back into your old content and figure out what have we produced over the last short period of time that can be reinvigorated into this content um, to, to increase its rankings yet again is, is a great way of, of refreshing content. And sort of on that topic for content, like what, when should you be creating new content versus doubling down on old content? Like any thoughts there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just go back to the format that Neil has used for, for the last couple of years, which is every week he tries his best to produce one new piece of content. But every week we have a team that's refreshing anywhere between five to 20 pieces of old content. Now, you have to take that into perspective. I mean, our, our blog has, I think, over 4,000 blog posts. So we can do that in a month's time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff to go back to. So it's just <coughs> depending on how large your website is. And, and one of the biggest things that we tend to talk about is 
the internet is already fairly bloated from, from the perspective of a lot of different content, a lot of blog posts. Most people have said the same thing over and over again. And so it is good to create new content, but that's why it's so much more impactful to go back and refresh old content because not a lot of brands do that. And that's a huge competitive edge. That is so fascinating. I've, I don't think I've ever heard about like going back to old content before. And I mean, obviously in the old days, probably wasn't that smart enough to like really appreciate it, but that's really cool to know that it's getting smarter and smarter at this type of thing. Absolutely. Cool. So are there any specific elements of content that massively improve your ability to rank up on a specific keyword? Yeah, I think it's it's just the general structure of your content. And, and I think if we're talking about blog posts, you want to make sure that you have headers splitting up every couple of paragraphs. So you don't just have one main H1 header and then just a huge body of content and then a conclusion. Like you want headers splitting different topic pieces up. I also think something you want to do with your content, and again, it's dependent on your audience, is don't use huge paragraphs anymore. I think a lot of us on the internet, we want to be able to skim through things. And when you have really thick paragraphs, it's really difficult to skim. So breaking up your paragraphs into, into like quick sentences to also give impact to certain sentences over others. I think mixing in images and videos is great to kind of give a little bit more of like a visual appeal to your content. And on top of that, internally linking. I think that's a huge part of sprucing up content is when you look at your website, there are going to be certain pages that external websites are linking to on a frequent basis, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have some pages that are receiving more love than others. The way you can spread that love out is having those main pages internally link to blog posts or, or deeper service pages and vice versa, have them all interlinked to each other. That'll make sure that this link juice is spreading through all of the content evenly and giving everything an opportunity to rank. So a lot of the times we don't provide a lot of internal links to our content and that does it a massive disservice. On top of that, Google also likes to see that your website's not a dead end with your content. And what I mean by that is, are you just trying to get a bunch of third party websites to link to you, but you don't ever link to anyone else? You know, Google wants to see that your website is, is almost like, people can come through and, and find other relevant resources that may not be your competition, but can still be highly authoritative to go to after your content, you see? So having outbound links from your website sometimes is just as important as having inbound links to that content. So I think these are all ways to kind of optimize your content to a, a 2020 slash 2021 standard. Yeah, it's amazing because like all these things really boil down to like a better ecosystem. Like you should want to talk about other resources and recommend other people and highlight your partners and everything else. And the fact that more and more like what should be good practices is being rewarded, like that just makes a better internet for sure. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it. Cool. Yeah. I mean, for anyone who watches this video, like this has got to be like, <laughs> just pure gold like master class in the quickest possible way to just cover so much stuff to know about seo so thank you so much already for everything you shared this is really awesome absolutely absolutely uh so speaking about making things easier um obviously like creating content is hard it takes a ton of work if you're me you procrastinate it for three to four months per white paper <laughs> um do you have uh two to three hacks you'd recommend for that you've seen companies doing like very effectively for creating content that's quality can rank well while requiring less work? Absolutely. One of the favorite things in, in like my toolkit that I've used for years now is uh, in, in more of like the content marketing lead generation space um, for almost any industry is what I call, I've dubbed it like the content cascade, which is essentially you can go one way or the other. So you can take a, a given topic that you know is a very hot topic in your industry and really go in depth on it from like a blog post perspective and create chapters, you know? So you may create six different chapters to really cover this topic. And those would be six individual blog posts. Once you see how those blog posts react through traffic and Google analytics, 
you can then take those blog posts and find ways to merge them into an ebook and put like good transition paragraphs or good transition pages between each chapter to make it really feel like a succinct ebook. Mm -hmm. The other way would be take some of your most successful ebooks and break up sections or chapters into individual blog posts. And so now what's starting to happen is you're not really rewriting and redoing a lot of work. You're leveraging assets that have already worked well with your audience and just putting them in different file formats for how different people want to consume that information. And so that takes a lot less work to do rather than consistently writing new eBooks and new, new blog posts blindly and not knowing if this topic is even going to resonate with your audience. So the content cascade is something that's like a quick hack that I try and give people is look at either blog posts that can be merged into an eBook or look into eBooks that can be distilled into blog posts. And right there, you're sitting on a gold mine of content. So that sounds easy. But I know that lots of people have created tons of blogs and that transition from blog post to ebook, uh, A, like doing it well is tough where people actually value it and B, what you do with it once you actually have that ebook um, is also challenging of like figuring out like how to actually like utilize it. Um, do you mind going first into sort of for like say you have like a very popular six blog series you want to turn that into an ebook. Like what now? Like once you have the ebook, what do you do with it? Yeah, one of the first steps I take is like what we've been talking about earlier about refreshing content is once the ebook is ready, I go back into all six of those blog posts and find the most relevant places within it and, and just create a custom little graphic that's kind of like a like a little uh, internal ad saying, Hey, if you want a lot more in-depth information about this topic, check out this ebook we just recently wrote. And so now you're internally linking between your original asset and your new asset. So doing something like that can bring a lot more attention to the ebook. Obviously you can also leverage these ebooks from like an advertising perspective. So put up a landing page, point some ads, either through social, depending on your market, put it through social media or through Google and, and get people to, to see that asset and want to come to you as a thought leader. I think those are two quick things that you can do to bring attention to, to the new asset. Um, beyond that, it's also, depending on your industry, create a resource hub on, on your website. I think a lot of the times websites just stop at the blog section. But most of the great websites out there, they not only have a blog section, they actually have a resource section in their nav bar. And when you click on that resource, it'll sometimes drop down into like an FAQ page. And in your FAQ page, if you feel like the blog or the ebook answers a question, then link to that in, in, the, in, the, in the question provided on the FAQ. Also create some sort of um, ebook list or white paper list or data sheet list where all of, your, all of those assets are aggregated on one specific page for people. So it's easy for them to find it through your website. But I think those are some of the quickest ways to go about taking your assets and, and putting them more in front of your users. Yeah, those are excellent points. Uh, one of the things I've been obsessed with for quite a while now is a company called Gong.io, just because oh, I God. think that they have like the most uh, unique and interesting choices of marketing, and mm -hmm. they've been growing at like an insane rate. So it's clearly working really well. But they've basically done what you're saying using like LinkedIn too where they're empowering employees to become like influencers on LinkedIn. They're putting up LinkedIn posts. They're having that same content on their website because LinkedIn doesn't interfere with your website SEO from my understanding. Um, and then they also are creating like little, like sort of like the ebook content pieces as like anchors. So it has like a little banner, like, Hey, download the like seven ways to like effective sales. And when you click on that, that's when they capture your email for getting the leads. And I think that it fits well into that where you're basically like leveraging the things you have and then turning it into content anchors that people are willing to share the information to access in a way that isn't that annoying. Like, hey, hey, uh, just like very intrusive that a lot of like blogs are when they like have pop ups all the time. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's a great point. I think LinkedIn is, is definitely becoming a, a, a great asset over the last few years. So mm -hmm. especially if you're in the B2B space, it, it, it can do wonders. 
Yeah, it definitely like combines that communal thing with also just reaching the people you want to reach, which is the best of both worlds. And it's like why at Everflow, we focused a lot on that just because like it's a good way to connect with the community and provide content um, while still building like something that gets stronger and stronger, the more relationships you build out of it. Yep. Cool. So um, regarding backlinks, um, what actually matters for back backlinks and what do companies mostly do wrong? Yeah. So backlinks are still a, a massive ranking factor for Google. Um, they always have been, and I think they will continue to be. It just depends on how you go about building them. That's, that's what's become the biggest thing that Google's cracked down on over the years. And so the biggest thing I let people know that Google looks at is relevancy with a backlink. Mm -hmm. So if a third party website is linking to you, they should more often than not be somewhere in your industry, somewhere within your niche. Um, websites like Forbes, Entrepreneur, Inc., these big publication web, source, web, web sources may be great, but they're not niche to anything. They're kind of for all industries, all businesses. And so they don't provide a ton of value. Sure, they can bring some great traffic, some qualified traffic, which we don't ever want to ignore. But having somebody that's within your space that's hyper relevant to your product is what's going to provide you even more qualified traffic and also great signals from Google. So I think relevancy of, of the domains is extremely important. And then I think something that people get wrong fairly often with link building is where they point the links to. So like more than 70% of links point to people's homepages, which can be great. But in all honesty, if somebody's talking about a specific product that you offer, why not link them specifically to that product page? Why make them start on your homepage and have to dig around your website to that product page? So linking to the proper sources is something that people get wrong often. And on top of that, one level deeper than it is leveraging better keyword phrases in the anchor text. So on the third party website that's linking to you, don't just say um, Neil Patel Excel and then link to our website. Say search engine optimization services or search engine optimization agency. Use something that's hyper relevant to what you do and then link to your SEO service page. And, and that's what's going to give great signals to Google about what this link is about, why it was built, and what's the overall uh, reason for it. So I think- uh, So lot, on that, sorry to interrupt you. Mm -hmm. uh, for that type, because like I know, I've known for a long time you're supposed to have like the anchor link actually have like the text that's relevant towards what you want to have like SEO ranking. But yep. in terms of natural- conversation writing it's really awkward to just like link someone for the first time using say like seo services mm -hmm. like you always want to start with like say like the first link being like np excel that's your first link and that one's linking out and then maybe later on you can be like request seo services or something like that that you link to exactly. like their demo page but is there some best tips there because it, it's a hard like when you're working with publications or content like it's a hard thing to provide them the, the right way to link to you. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you have that conversation in a way that's natural rather than just feels like you're, you're link stuffing? Yeah, great question. I think it just comes down to diversifying that anchor text, you know? And I think a lot of the time we as companies just want to rank for like one main head term. And, and sometimes we need to just do a little bit more keyword research and discover what are some surrounding terms to that main keyword that also sound incredibly conversational, fit, fit, fit great within the content. And so you may have to have multiple links like what you just brought up. Introduce the domain first, then introduce one of their main services, then introduce a really niche service. And so I think just doing that extra level of keyword research, finding a couple groupings of keywords, and sometimes telling the publication, look, this is what I wrote in it, or this is what you can write about, but here are just maybe two or three extra keywords that if you want to include them, go for it. It's going to sound more natural and, and, and hopefully it's going to provide a great user experience because they'll know exactly what they're clicking on and exactly what they're going to see at the end of that link. So with that, is it sort of like being like, Hey, um, so an example would be like, we got a lot of like Everflow reviews where we're working with like a blogger creating a content review about Everflow is like the best way to be like, Hey, in addition to linking Everflow here, do you mind like, 
linking our platform page here. And then finally, like we have a really great blog about how to launch an affiliate program. Yes. Like, is it, is that the best way to, to handle these like sort of conversations? Absolutely, Michael. I think that gives not only the, the blogger so much more context as to what they can include. You also just shave down a ton of research time for them. So they're probably more apt to do more reviews for you in the future. Um, but, but what you just said was spot on. It's awesome. Yeah. I never thought about providing them with specific, like extra content to link into. Mm -hmm. Usually you think like, Oh, one link's enough, but it sounds like you get a lot more value if you have a few links and they become more and more relevant as links go. Absolutely. Cool. So if you were going to start your own uh, e-commerce company in a niche space, uh, what would be the three activities you would prioritize um, in 2021 as part of your like launch and go to market plan? Uh, yeah, I think, I think it would all begin with obviously choosing the right platform to build my website on. So I, I would probably go with Shopify. Um, and, and from there, I think the first three things that I would emphasize for my go-to-market strategy would be creating the most mobile-friendly and site-speed-friendly website possible. So ensuring that those two technical aspects are absolutely safe and sound because Google's algorithm has become a mobile-only index. I think a couple of years ago, we heard this mobile first topic, which was, hey, well, we're going to index the mobile aspects first and then your desktop aspects. But a couple of months ago, they switched it to a mobile only, which is a drastic shift, meaning it's really only the mobile aspects of your website that are causing your rankings to move up or down. So making the most mobile friendly website, that's also incredibly quick to load. I would also emphasize, um, what is my content strategy? So am I producing one blog a week, two blogs a week, three blogs a week? And, and I have to do it based off my audience's data and what they're requesting, what some of my competition's doing. And then once I have enough blogs, creating that strategy for going back to them and constantly refreshing them, you know? So that would be the second aspect is content creation and content refreshing. And then the third aspect would be when I'm creating that content, I always want to keep in mind, what are other relevant sources in my industry wanting to link to. I call it a linkable asset. So anytime you're creating content, think about, is this a linkable asset? If I was sitting at the other side of the website or, or of a third-party website, would I want to link back to this content? Do I see it authoritative enough to link back to? So in generating organic links, your content can help be a magnet for all of that. So the three aspects would be technical, site speed, and mobile. Second one would be content generation and content refreshing. And third one would be setting myself up for success with organic link building through creating linkable content. That's awesome. <laughs> it's so like clear and easy to understand and actionable. Yeah. Great. And um, so if anyone has any questions in the audience, uh, feel free to put them in in the Q and A and we'll answer those uh, at the end. Um, but uh, Matt, um, do you see any major changes coming in the near horizon around SEO? Yeah, um, I think anybody who has been paying attention to Google and, and some of their algorithm shifts may be aware of this or may not. Um, it's actually something that's monumental in Google's history that's about to occur, which is Google's about to release an algorithm in, in uh, towards the end of Q1 of 2021. Um, they're calling it like the, the user experience algorithm, like in short term, which is the first time Google is coming out and announcing like a future massive update. Normally they come out in a press release after the fact and tell you, oh yeah, <laughs> last month we released this massive change to the internet. This time they're gave, they gave us like a six to eight month um, heads up because they know that it's gonna have a drastic shift in, in the search engine results. And what this algorithm change is going to do is it's putting user experience at the forefront of who ranks. And, and what that means is a couple different factors. Google's calling it the core web vitals. That's gonna be a term that you guys are gonna hear for months and years to come is, what are your core web vitals? How are your core web vitals performing? And there's a couple key ranking factors in that core web vital umbrella. So one of the first ones being um, uh, time to, to first paint, which is basically how quickly after somebody clicks on your link, are the first elements of your page coming up on the website. Sorry, time Another to first what? 
it's 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 first contentful paint. That's that's like the official term for it. Um, first contentful paint. I try and give it a much easier term, which is like time to first image or time to first content. It's just how quickly is that information being displayed on the screen. Another factor is um, how quickly after a page loads can a user interact with it. So it's like time to interaction. So even though things are loading, can I click on stuff already? Can I scroll down already? Or is all that kind of put on hold while I'm sitting there watching this page develop in front of my eyes? Mm -hmm. And then the third major factor is something that I think a lot of us have become annoyed with over the years that Google's trying to address and weed out, which is mm -hmm. if you have too much JavaScript and too many pop-ups and different things affecting the experience, that can start to hurt your rankings now because I'll give you a quick example. If I go to click on something on my mobile phone and the spot that I go to click right before I click slightly shifts down and I click on something else, mm -hmm. there's rarely ever been a positive feeling from that. <laughs> You're kind of like, oh shoot, why the heck did that happen? And then you go <laughs> back and, or, or you leave the website, you know? So that's also something that's going to be part of these core web vitals is how much is your page shifting after the initial load, because it's still trying to load more elements in the background and that's causing a negative user experience. So mm -hmm. core, core web vitals is something that we're starting to talk about as an agency. Users and, and SEO experts out there are starting to figure out how to optimize around these elements because this algorithm shift is going to happen, I think around April of 2021. And so there's stuff that we could be doing now to get in preparation of that shift. Yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, well, this has all been like super fantastic. Uh, actually, we have a Q and A. Um, so, question: um, How uh, can SEO help my Shopify store with selling women apparel? Um, I can't compete with the right keywords because there's so many brands out there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of the. Um the catch 22 with SEO is that it, it's an open field for all brands to rank. I think anytime you have smaller websites trying to compete with major brands like Macy's, JCPenney, uh, whoever have you out there, or even Amazon, right? That's, that's the behemoth in the space is you have to look at keywords from a much different perspective. You may not be able to rank for women's apparel or women's t-shirt or women's shoes, but you can rank for women's heels size eight black. You, you can go after more of the long tail keywords that some of these bigger brands are never optimizing around because they just don't have to. But there's still a lot of market value in those keywords. And not only is there market value, but there's actually more buying intent. Because what I tell people is, if my wife or myself were to type in women's shoes, the search engine and all major brands honestly have no idea what I'm doing with that search term. There's not a lot of information about the intent behind that keyword. Am I doing research on women's shoes? Am I just browsing some women's shoes? Am I putting on a training for my SEO team and using that keyword as a quick training tool? There's, there's no idea behind the keyword. But a keyword like black size nine women's heel, that's a keyword that has a lot of buying intent behind it. The, whoever's typing that in within the next 24 to 48 hours is probably going to be making a purchase. So Starting to look at your keyword research from a long keyword perspective is how you can kind of overtake those behemoths in the space. Awesome. Uh, another question came in. Uh, can I use uh, Instagram and Facebook photos to help rank better with uh, Google SEO? That is a tough one. Um, as it currently stands, Instagram doesn't really rank for like SEO terms. What, what you can use with social media is an indirect way of impacting SEO. And what I mean by that is there is a relationship and kind of like a correlation between social signals and SEO signals. And, and what I mean by that is over the years, Google has tried to do everything in its power to customize its algorithm to better understand brands. Google wants to rank brands high. They want to weed out the, the, the spammy websites by determining they're not an official brand, they're not legitimate, and they want to boost up the websites that do represent good, real brands. And a lot of the times, 
while Google can't really use Instagram signals, Google can still see how much engagement some of your photos and Facebook photos are receiving. Google can still see in the comment sections if people are mentioning your brand name, if they're tweeting about it, if they're, if they're going ahead and, and, and sharing it with other people. These are all signals that Google can still see, but they can't really rank those images or those posts. So I think it's, it's, it is a little bit of a catch-22. Leverage those social media brands to help boost up your brand, um, and it will have a correlation over time in your SEO rankings. Definitely like all the other stuff, it's like do stuff that is effective in reaching your audience and it will always help you with the SEO side as well. Yep. Yep. Uh, another question. Um, do old school redirect links affect SEO negatively? Um, and I do see the second part of that. Is there a recommendation to avoid the impact of affiliate links? Um, yeah, I think there, there's two questions though. Cause like the first one, like say you did like a link building strategy in the past and you have a ton of links from like link farms. Um, mm -hmm. Does that affect you negatively? Is there something you should be doing there? Yeah, I, I think it, it just depends on um, how relevant those websites were to your domain. Um, so if you were doing like link farm tactics uh, a couple of years ago, those can negatively affect you today. Uh, it may not be like an actual penalty from Google, but what you'll notice is there's almost like a ceiling on your rankings where mm -hmm. no matter what you do, no matter how great your SEO may seem to you, you never kind of get above page three of Google. Um, and so one of the best things you could do is, is what's called like a link disavow process, which is basically telling Google that this link is like wrongfully linking to you. You want Google to kind of discount that link and not index it as part of your link profile. So I think it just comes down to taking a good peek at your link profile and ensuring that everything looks organic. Everything seems like it's natural and, and relevant to your industry. And when it comes to redirects, I know there, there's been a, a hot topic over years, which is buy a bunch of domains that are similar to yours and then kind of redirect them back into your domain. Mm -hmm. Again, that can be extremely positive from an SEO standpoint. The only time that can become negative is if there was an existing website on a domain you purchased and that website was doing shady tactics and then you redirect that domain into yours, that can have a negative touch because Google's still looking at that website in, in kind of like a blacklisted way. Um, mm -hmm. So always do your homework before purchasing a domain of what type of website was on it, what type of links are pointing to that domain before redirecting it into yours. And then for the other part of that with the like traditional affiliate links that are using like the encrypted code and redirection, um, like what is the impacts of that on SEO? Again, I think it all comes down to all of these elements need to be as trustworthy as possible. Um, if, if anything like cloaking is happening and, and cloaking, just a quick definition is you're, you're showing something to a user, but showing something completely different to the search engine or vice versa, that, that does look like a shady tactic to Google. And so you just want to make sure that any redirects, anything that's happening along those lines with affiliate links is actually something that's natural to the user experience. And so long as that's happening, it should be fine. Um, I, I've never really noticed too often that like affiliate links have like a major positive boost in SEO or a negative, negative hindering on SEO campaigns. They're just kind of a, another source of traffic. That's that's kind of the way Google looks at it. It's, it's almost the same way I, I respond on like email marketing links. If I have a bunch of emails that have links in them that are bringing them back to my website, Google's not going to give me a lot of positive signals for that because that's something that can be easily manipulated, you know? So it just depends on, on doing trustworthy tactics, having trustworthy affiliates pointing back to you. Awesome. And thanks to the audience for the questions. Uh, so just to wrap it up, um, if someone really wanted to have great SEO support uh, from a fantastic agency, uh, how can they reach you and sort of like, what's the process there? Yeah, great question. I think uh, one of the quickest ways would be just going to our website, uh, npxcel.com. And Excel is spelled A-C-C-E-L. It's kind of a shortened word on uh, accelerator. 
Uh, and, and I think that's the biggest approach to, to how we do marketing is we want to help small to medium businesses really accelerate what they're currently doing. Um, so you could go to npxl.com. Um, if, if you guys have a large enough business and want to partner with us, we also have npxl.com forward slash partners. Um, but I think through that website, we have enough call to actions where you can find out how to reach out to us um, and, and start the, the process of, of working with us. So yeah, looking forward to any of you reaching out. If you guys want to find me, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I can also help guide you into the agency. Um, either I can give my LinkedIn link to Michael after this, or you can find me on LinkedIn uh, with my name, Matthew Santos. Um, and I'd be more than happy to have conversations with you on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thanks again, Matt. This was like fantastic. There's so many juicy insights from this. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise. Of course. And I appreciate Everflow and you, Michael, for having me today. It's been a great experience. Awesome. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week and uh, happy Turkey Day. All right. Have a happy <laughs> Thanksgiving. <laughs>